It's uh, strange. I was over two meters before the teleportation. Um, there are three words in uh, the title of this talk. Only one of them is really important. We'll talk a little bit about pixels today, two. Uh, well, actually, look at that. There are four words. The middle two uh, make it sound like a kind of political proposition, which in a way it is. But the fourth word, people, is the only one that's truly important. And although this is a talk about technology, I'm going to invite you to judge me uh, based on whether I succeed in convincing you that it's people that are important here. So uh, let's think about the last 30 years. What is it that we have pervasively today in our lives that we didn't have 30 years ago? 30 years ago, we had food, clothes, bicycles, airplanes, pets, uh, weapons of mass destruction. Um, it's not a trick question. Of course, what we have today that we didn't have then is computers. Computers in many different forms. We don't actually call them computers anymore. It doesn't sound sophisticated enough. We call them smartphones, and we call them tablets, and sometimes we even still call them laptops. But I find it suspicious when people avoid a word, because that's what we've put all around ourselves. That's what we've allowed to permeate uh, and infest our lives, is computers. This talk is not about whether it's a good idea to allow computers so deeply into our lives. That's a, a different discussion, maybe for later at night. Um, but it is a discussion today about what we can do to make that as good as possible, uh, because it's a fait accompli, right? It's, we have to take it as given that our lives are filled with computers, because it's true. And it's a choice we've made. We make that choice by buying, by purchasing. Now, there are two main characteristics of computers. One is what they do, uh, and that we spent a great deal of time and energy and effort and scientific inquiry and engineering on in the last 30 years. Computers have faster processors, more disk, uh, computer graphics, networks, the cloud, the web, uh, even mobile. Um, that's one big category, and we choose computers for that. The other main characteristic of computers is how we talk to them and how they talk to us. That's the user interface, and we don't really get to choose that part, or we don't think about it when we choose. Someone else designs it, and someone else gives it to us. I would say that it's dangerous to not think about that, because after all, at the end of the day, the UI, the interface, is all we have. All we have is what we can see and what we can hear and maybe even what we can touch. But we don't ask those questions. So I'm going to ask you to join me in applying a formula, a kind of simple mathematical formula. It's not very good, really, but it's a test. I want you to help me judge different kinds of technology, different kinds of machines with this test. And we're think, going to think about how sophisticated the interface is and how much the machine lets you do. So let's uh, take a look at some computers that are about 30 years apart. Maybe a few of you are old enough to remember this device. This is the Apple II Plus. In 1978, when you got this machine, you took it out of its box and you plugged it into the television, and you turned it on, and it made a beeping sound, and then this computer did nothing. <laughs> but it blinked at you, and that blink meant that you could type. And what you were typing into was a programming language. So this computer was an object of pure potential. It said, program me. It said, create. It said, make something new, and people did. Herbie Hancock invented new kinds of music. Dan Gorlin invented new kinds of video games. And two guys in a garage in Massachusetts, in the United States, made VisiCalc, the world's first electronic spreadsheet. And it was such a great idea, it was a new category, that it increased the sales of these machines by a factor of 10. So that's very unsophisticated interface, very capable machine. We'll go forward 30 years now, this is what computers look like. You take these computers out of their box, and they literally sing to you. They're beautiful. They have a very sophistic sophisticated interface, but for what? What does the interface let you do? Mm, maybe not so much. It lets you consume media, choose this song or that song, A or B. But would you use this computer if you were an architect to design? Would you use it if you were an accountant? Would you use it if you were a musician? Would you use it if you were a programmer? No, you can't. What you have to use is the grandchild of this. Now, interestingly, all these computers are made by the same company, but they're three very, very different ideas. This is the computer that we all use today when we work, when we want to be professionals. Uh, but the UI, the interface, has not changed. It has not been updated. It's literally the same set of ideas, windows and icons and a mouse, 
that it was 30 years ago. So it's time for a change, and it's really important for us to change because we're now limited by that interface. We, as humans, deserve better. So this is not a sad talk. This is actually an opportunity. And I'm here with you today from a company called Oblong. Oblong's mission is to create those new computers by starting with the interface. If you get the interface right, this is my belief, everything else comes for free. And you've built very, very powerful systems indeed. So I'm going to go rapidly through five principles that we use at Oblong to figure out if we're on the right track, if we're going in the right direction. Number one, human hands. This is arguably the most sophisticated manipulatory instrument that has evolved on this planet. I don't know, maybe we can talk to the octopus, but basically for mammals, this is incredible. This is how we understand the world. It's not just input, but output as well. So we can manipulate the world, but we can feel it, right? I.O., that's very important. So in 2000, when Steven Spielberg asked my team and I to teach him about the future of computers, what would computers look like, we said, hands your actors should stand in the middle of giant screens and conduct information as if they were conducting an orchestra. And he loved that idea. So we went out to Hollywood and uh, we designed these systems for the film. We designed them by working as if we would have to build them someday. That's a hint. Uh, and we worked incredibly hard, designed new language, taught the actors, trained the actors. And so when we filmed, the actors really understood what they were doing. And these scenes are now a kind of standard that journalists use when they write about new technology and new user interface. And it's already 10 years old. So this was such a success. It's interesting to think about publishing. This is a new kind of publishing. This is a way to get ideas out into the heads of hundreds of millions of people and let them judge for themselves if the ideas are good or not. Principle number two, space, geometry, room space, architectural space. space is where the action is. Space is where everything happens for us except computers. Computers don't understand space. If you're a programmer or if you know some programmers uh, and you ever work with computer graphics and you have a screen, this is 0, 0, the upper left-hand corner. If you're really lucky, 0, 0 is down here, but probably it's up here. What about your screen over here? Well, 0, 0. Why is that OK? They're not the same pixel. They're not the same screen. So the first thing that we did at Oblong is to teach the computers about space, to teach them that the pixels are actually in the room with us. And when you make that happen, then all sorts of things open up. So this is what you could see if you visited our laboratory in Los Angeles. This is actual Minority Report, Minority Report working for real. Pointing, as you see, is an incredibly powerful gesture. It lets you connect your body to distant space. And all humans are already experts at pointing. Everyone knows how to point. So if you uh, let someone use this system for the first time, you tell them point. And they point, and they're an expert. You can navigate around two-dimensional pictorial spaces. Uh, and it's a very cinematic feeling, which is important. Cinema is a very powerful language. You can work intimately and use your hands to gather information, sculpt it, select it, filter it. You can reach out and grab virtual parts of the 3D world and manipulate them as if they were real. And there's something very powerful about having so many pixels attached to you. Or you can say that those pixels are static in space and the display moves under them. Sometimes there's real objects, and only if the computer understands space can you move these objects around, can you control them. And navigation is so important. Computer graphics has done amazing things for 15 years, but it's only supporting the eyes. Now it supports the part of your brain that understands motion and your relationship to the world as you move through it. And that gives you real understanding. Annotation, you should always be able to draw, even if you only want to make circles or cross something out. Uh, and of course, that can get very, uh, very complex as well. You can spin the world and draw in it. It's a whole new way of thinking about your relationship to a machine. And now work starts. So you build work with these systems, medical systems. This is uh, the front end for an oil field reservoir simulator. Navigation is important. You fly through it. You save state. You snapshot. You retrieve other snapshots. You move pieces of the system around and send it to the simulation. And so you can ask questions about the physical world inside the physical world, exactly as you would work if you were a sculptor.
And this is a, an air traffic control simulation in which space is important and time is important. You fly around the globe and then you turn on time. And these are all the flights that were in the air above the United States at a certain moment. It's incredibly complicated and your brain needs all the help it can get to understand it. And the help that your brain needs is navigation. It's flying around, it's reaching out and picking up pieces of the real world uh, pieces of the digital world to understand them the same way you would understand pieces of the real world. That's an important thing. Oblong calls that system of software a spatial operating environment. The name is G-Speak. It's a new kind of OS that runs across many screens and many devices. Agency. This is my favorite word. This is uh, a word in English that means power, but not raw power, not political power. It means the power to create the power to change the world in a way that you conceive. Uh, and machines must be built to give people agency. This thing does not give you agency. It pretends to, but it just gives you a few choices. We need computers that are like artists' tools, that are like professional tools. If they start that way, then you can do anything. And you build these systems starting with the idea of beauty. Also comedy, but I'm not allowed to say that. I get in trouble. But it is important for humor to be inside computers, inside programming, and inside the way we use them. This system I want you to think of as a metaphor. It's called Tamper, uh, and it's the level of agency that we want computers to have. This system allows you to work through 18 or 24 films frame by frame and reach into the films, grab elements, grab characters and props, put them on a new table and move them around, and then go to a different film, pick out a different character, a different piece, and bring it into the scene. Sometimes you point and grab, sometimes you touch. Each time, it's whatever is the appropriate modality. If you need to move things, then the friction of your hand is important. If you're talking about action at a distance, then pointing is important. This is how every interaction between a human and a computer should be. You should feel this powerful, but also this connected to the machine in a virtuous way, in an honest way. Pixels. I think we're at the beginning of an enormous change. No one knows it yet, but this is the last moment when people will care about devices. Now think about a device, a computer. Uh, it has applications, it has data, maybe it has communications. When you use it, all of that stops at the boundary of the machine. What's important, though, is the pixels, and oblong systems are designed to give you control over any pixels anywhere, not just the ones on this device, not just the ones on that screen or that screen or a laptop, all of them. Our motto is that you should be able to walk up to any screen in the world and point to it, and by pointing at it, reach through those pixels and get at your data, your communications, your games, uh, whatever you want, your applications. Uh, and this is a recent system that we've built. Of course, we're interested in getting rid of the gloves. Uh, this is a system called Seismo, and it lets you explore uh, earthquakes, 20 years of earthquake data around the world. Uh, and this kind of incredibly fluid interface means that your body, which has wisdom, your body has wisdom, can enter into the conversation. The inventor of this system is the man you see using it, and he's actually a swimmer, and I think that comes out in what you see. It feels like swimming through information. So every time you give people a new opportunity to spin the scene, to move through information, you give them a new opportunity to understand it and to manipulate it as well. And finally, and this is an important idea, plurality. Right now, computers are for one person at a time. In the future, of course, in the real world, there are multiple people who work together. They collaborate. Of course, there are many screens. There are more screens and more pixels all the time. And there's more and more different ways of using input. There are phones and tablets and mice and keyboards and gesture and spatial wands and so forth. And we're building systems now, like the mezzanine product, that uh, allow groups of people to work together. It's something that today's computers are very, very bad at. Each computer is for one person. Instead, if you use the idea that pixels belong to everyone, then everyone can collaborate, including the machine. So here you see people uh, working together in a professional setting. Maybe they're in an advertising agency. And many people can contribute to the work all at the same time using different devices. Uh, here's a tablet machine, and it can be used to control the space, to work through the space. You can upload content, uh, and again, people are working all at the same time. It's like the real world. It's like glass blowing, where it takes at least three or four people to create something wonderful. That's how the real world is. That's how the machine world should be. 
I have well more than run out of my time and no doubt your patience, so I will skip this video. You can see it on the Oblong website if you'd like to see more. I'd like to end with, uh, with one single idea. Uh, people are very interested in the future. They want to know what's coming, and they usually wait for it to arrive, right? You wait around to see which future you inherit. But I think that's a risky proposition, because that way, if that's how we work, we don't know what future we get. The only way we can be sure that we get a future that we like and that is befitting of us as humans and humanity is if we ourselves build it. So I charge you, all of you, to build the future that we should have. Thank you for your time.